Welcome back, everyone. We have another question and answer period for the next hour. If there's any questions you have, you could definitely uh, communicate through social media. We have a lot of questions already, so we're just, just going to dive right in. And let me give my disclaimer before I get started. Anything that I say is definitely not meant to diagnose or replace your medical care. Check with your doctor before um, doing any of the things we're going to talk about. So, um, all right, let's... Uh, Let's talk. Let's answer some questions. And Steve, uh, tell tell us where we're at right now. With All right. these questions coming in. Well, where we're at is we're very apologetic because a couple of weeks back, Intizar was in the queue there holding and got bumped off by our system after waiting for an hour. So we feel just awful about that, but we want to bring her back on with a question. Intizar, are you with us? Yes, I am. Okay, you're go ahead with Doctor Berg. You're on the air. All right. Thank you. Hi, Doctor Berg. Hello. I have hi, I have been on healthy keto and I have for nearly 18 months and I believe I have been with insulin resistance for years without knowing. I noticed uh, so much improvement in my health. However, despite being so strict and most days just one meal a day, but the moment I consume a tiny slice of beetroot or two sticks of celery, I get messed up easily. I notice this by going to the toilet more often. Um, yeah, that's, that's my question. I got it. So there's certain, uh, vegetables that, uh, trigger, um, give you a laxative effect. Is that right? Um, yeah, w w w what I'm trying to say, I, I can't even do any, uh, any keto dessert, you know? And right. Well, here, the problem is that, um, a lot of people are sensitive to all the sugar alcohols. It, it creates a laxative effect. And especially a lot of the new um, ingredients to the so-called healthy um, keto-friendly foods and snacks like the functional fibers, the soluble corn fibers, the tapioca uh, fibers and starches. So there's a lot of stuff in there that I don't even, I, I don't recommend that you consume. So, um, you may be okay by making your own dessert with uh, a high quality combination of erythritol in monk fruit or stevia. But you have to realize that some of these sweeteners, they, they stick in all these additional added things that you don't want in your body. So uh, you may need to just do this without those desserts right now and uh, keep your food basic. In the meantime, um, I think what would help you is to uh, slowly work on your microflora, start building up your, your good bacteria. And you could do that by fermented vegetables like sauerkraut and kimchi are the best. Um, that's what I would do if I were you. Okay, thank you. I, I have a tiny question, if it's okay to take it or not. If it's tiny enough. Yeah, it is tiny. <laughs> uh, thank you. The other thing is, I I had MRI scan uh, and it showed like I have a soft tissue thickening on my inner side of gallbladder, and this related to noodles in my neck. And I tried uh, gallbladder formula and totka, which made things worse. Uh, any any advice on that? Well, that was a tiny, tiny question. Uh, um, <laughs> for something like that, I would probably need a lot more information to, because it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, so I really don't have an answer. I'd have to, you know, it's, when you try to answer a question like that, you need a, a good history. And it's not just a, like, for example, I was hoping you would ask a question, can I drink lemon water on the ketogenic diet? Like a tiny, simple question, but that one involves a little more complexity. Okay. Anyway, right. thank you so much. You're thank welcome. you, Intizar. I appreciate it. I'm glad we were able to get back with you after this, uh, after getting bumped off several weeks ago. So let's go straight to social media. And this is sort of an interesting question. PC from YouTube uh, asks, why do brain cells use glucose first if they prefer ketones? I don't know if brain cells can prefer something, but <laughs> what, what's the deal? Well, they, they don't. Um, require glucose first. In fact, if given the choice between glucose and ketones, they'll always pick the uh, ketones first. 
Um, and so they do need a certain amount of glucose. And this is where it becomes really confusing to people because they, well, I need to start eating glucose. No, you don't. Any glucose that the body needs can be um, easily generated by your own liver. It's called gluconeogenesis. And so you don't really need any sugar at all. Um, the small amount that you do need can be made from non-carbohydrate sources. Uh, but because here's the problem, if you start doing more sugar and feeding the brain sugar, you develop resistance to that and you damage the neurons. This is what's behind Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's. And now that fuel doesn't work anymore. It doesn't work. So basically the, all those conditions, neurodegenerative conditions are there because of they're starving to death because they can't get glucose because you overfed them glucose. Uh, and the body blocks that. So the only way to fix that is to feed it ketones, which just goes to a different pathway. And then you can, they can finally get fuel and they start getting better. So um, I hope that answered that, but it's, a, it's an important point. You definitely do not need glucose. The brain doesn't like it. And uh, um, it, it needs to get the quick energy from glucose a certain amount, but all that should be made. It's called endogenous. In, in, from an endogenous source from, from within, not externally. Very good. Okay. Also from YouTube, GA uh, wants to know, uh, boy, you talk a lot about problems with thyroids. Could you please discuss the topic of borderline hypothyroidism? My blood numbers are borderline and now I'm feeling exhausted and need to sleep 14 hours a day. How can we help GA? <clears throat> Most of these thyroid conditions are not primary. They're secondary, usually either from too much estrogen. That can be one. Um, that's why pregnant women or, um, or people taking birth control pills or on hormone replacement therapy, they start developing thyroid issues. Or it could be the liver is not working that well. Either you have a fatty liver or you have a problem with the gallbladder and you can't convert these thyroid hormones. So if you work on both of those areas, chances are you might do really good. Now, Hashimoto's is an autoimmune and that problem seems to be in proved greatly when you start taking selenium. There's a really good video you should watch on. I can't remember the name of it, but it's, it has to do with all the different ways, all the different things you can do to increase the conversion of the T4 to T3, the active form of the thyroid hormone. And if you go through that video, you may spot your problem. So, um, you'll have to, um, find out what video that is. If you just search Dr. Berg and hypothyroidism, you might find it. All right. That's great. And uh, by the way, we've got a great lineup. We have, uh, we're not going to bring you on right now, Fatima, but she's from New Jersey, but let's find out where other people are from. Uh, they are coming to us from UK, Canada, Ghana, Romania, Italy, Greece, India, Pakistan, Japan, Taiwan, South Africa, Egypt, Germany, Norway, Mexico, France, Trinidad and Tobago, Algeria, Belgium, Ethiopia, Hungary, Hungary, excuse me, uh, South Korea, Nigeria, Australia, the Netherlands, Israel, Iraq, Sweden, Chile, Morocco, Ireland, good grief, Bali, Switzerland, the Bahamas, Iceland, I don't think we've heard from them before, Beirut, uh, Cameroon, Finland, Argentina, and of course, all across these United States, including New Jersey, where Fatima will be joining us later in the show. And let's see, from that, we should go to our first quiz question now that I'm exhausted from Terry's list. And Doc here, if he would read that for us. Steve, I don't know why we don't get anyone from North Korea. Uh, I'm not sure why that is. But uh, okay, so here's the first question. It's the true or false. Uh, the biggest reason for chronic fatigue is diet related. Is that true or is it false? All right, dig in, audience. Let's see, let's, uh, sometimes the people in social media feel that we might be neglecting them, and I don't want them to get that sense at all. So let's go over to Facebook. Monica, should we drink ketones on keto? Are they necessary? They're not necessary unless you have maybe Alzheimer's or dementia, um, or let's say you're doing some type of sport event. It's much better if you get your ketones from your own fat than to take them externally. Plus, they're very, very expensive. And I have experimented on the different types of ketones. There's, um, there's more potent ketones you can take that basically takes, tastes like jet fuel. It's disgusting. Um, honestly, 
they may improve your energy by maybe 3%. I mean, it's just, it's not enough to justify the tremendous cost. So I think the best way to do is to fine tune your own body to make really good ketones. Now, more ketones, the better the, um, the mental, the cognitive function, the more ketones, the, uh, the better the, um, your exercise will be. And so the ketogenic diet produces a certain amount of ketones, but then when you add intermittent fasting, you'll get deeper into ketosis and believe it or not, you'll have better energy for workouts once you adapt and you have better cognitive uh, function. That's memory, focus, concentration, and ability to learn something. I mean, that's, that's huge right there. Incredible. Well, this falls under the category of, I saw a video. In this case, Luke from Facebook saw a video that said bone broth can, or can bone broth knock you out of ketosis. Is that true? What are your thoughts? Yeah, because it's protein, right? And so when you're doing fasting, um, or no, yeah, forgive you know, me. They when were, you eat, I'm sorry, doc. Your diet, you're going to have to eat protein, right? You're going to have to eat protein. So you can do bone broth, but when you're fasting, a lot of people take bone broth, but they don't realize that that, that protein in there um, affects insulin. And so not just carbohydrates can affect insulin, protein does. And so it's going to inhibit your ketosis for sure. The two things that don't affect insulin uh, are fat and fiber. So, um, but protein does, protein and carbs do. So um, that wouldn't be a good thing to take if you're fasting. Very good. Okay, let's. We've already got an answer for our quiz questions, and uh, the audience is pretty sure of themselves. Ninety-five. Oh, first of all, true false. The biggest reason for chronic fatigue is diet related, and our audience, ninety-five percent of them, say true, and a measly five percent say false. Who's right? Okay, so <clears throat> it is true that your diet's going to create fatigue. Okay. But I guess maybe I should have clarified this. Um, when we're dealing with chronic fatigue syndrome, um, it's, it's related to uh, a very huge percentage of that is related to viruses, okay? Latent viruses, I'm going to be doing a video on this, um, like the um, Epstein-Barr virus, for example. Um, these, these cases that have chronic fatigue syndrome with fibromyalgia, uh, it's definitely viral related. In fact, um, there's certain viruses that can go in remission and out of remission, which means they, they can lie dormant for years and they're reactivated uh, when you go through stress. But the point is that um, 70%, okay, that's the majority of chronic fatigue cases are related to more viruses. So <clears throat> the key is um, how do you deal with those viruses? Well, a little bit later in this presentation, I'm going to explain that. But if you're dealing with chronic fatigue, you definitely need to go on keto for sure. Um, but you may find that your fatigue is still there because of this viral connection. So there's some real interesting data that I will share in the video coming up as well as one of the most powerful uh, remedies for that. So stay tuned for that mystery. Very good. Okay, another fasting question. Angela, again from Facebook has completed three glorious weeks of healthy keto. I added the glorious NIF. Can I take your keto aminos and nutritional yeast while fasting? Um, yes, you can. And I'm going to tell you what's different about these keto amino acids. They're a type of amino acid. See, it's not an actual protein. It's the thing that uh, is already broken down into protein. And pretty much all different types of protein, like eggs, fish, meat, uh, a good percentage of it, um, a half of it or more turns into glucose. These amino acids, only a tiny bit, like 0.2% turns into sugar. So it's such a small amount, it, it won't affect your, uh, your ketosis like these other proteins will. There's a lot of research behind it. Um, so it's really good for those people that want to do prolonged fast and want to get amino acids. It's really good for those people that are in uh, some type of recovery situation. They want to increase their recovery after exercise. 
um, because it, it's just it's like the straight uh, blend of amino acids in the right ratios. Um, and then you asked about what was it keto aminos and what was the other one, Steve? Uh, sorry, I already queued up to another question. Let me see if I can find it. I'm sorry, Doc, I can't, and my memory has failed me. Let's see. Okay, that's fine. But anyway, um, let's see. Let's uh, move on to something else. And I lost that too. So in, in lieu of that, why don't we go to our uh, green room and let's bring up uh, Fatima, who I've been talking about and she's been waiting patiently. Uh, and Fatima, you're on with Dr. Berg. Hello, how are you? Great, thank you. So uh, I had a question about uh, oh, one meal a day fasting. I do dry fasting because I, I don't, uh, it's a religious fast and I cannot drink water in that. So uh, if in Omed, I don't feel fatigue, it's okay with me. So do you recommend it every day or every other day? Is there any point we can stop? Or we can just do it uh, for every day. I'm 140 pounds. I'm 31 years old, five foot four inch, and uh, I don't have to lose a lot of weight. But I just wanna do it for for health. Uh, I, it's not for weight loss. I I may lose uh, four or five kgs more, but it's it's for health benefits, not. Loss. Listen, listen. Our bodies um, were totally developed to um, not eat so frequently. So, if you could, if you could do one meal a day, I think that would be better for the majority of the adult population um, um, because the benefits of that twenty-three hour fast are huge for your cognitive function, for preventing so many health issues. Um, just eat eat enough calories and make sure you're it's nutrient dense. I think I think you should do it on a regular basis, and I think that'll be very very therapeutic for you, not just for weight loss, um, but for a lot of different things. In fact, I mean, like a lot of the research on animals um, and even insects. I mean, you start cutting down the frequency of the meal and you extend their life. I mean, that's that's bizarre. So um, there's a lot of magic into that, and um, I would be doing one meal a day. Um, if I could, but the problem is when myself is I, I will lose too much weight. So, um, but because my metabolism is really so fast. If I lose so much but weight, if you if I lose can deal with that weight, issue, I, I think one meal a day would be the ideal situation, especially um, when you start getting in your 40s and 50s and 60s. All right. Well, Fatima, okay, do you recommend HIIT with the with one meal a day or every day? Yes, every day. Exercise. Do it every day. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Right. You're welcome. That's that's great, Fatima. We're glad you finally got your question. And boy, as a part of your routine diet, as a part of your faith, it looks like you're on the right track. So that's just wonderful. I think Steve, you do one meal a day, right? Well, I really do, and I'll just be honest with the uh, the audience. I have a little trouble being a perfect keto guy, uh, but man, intermittent fasting, first of all, knocks out a couple of potential meals a day where I would be prone to eating wrong, but I'm not giving it up. I, I used to do try to do three freezer burn lean cuisines a day, and that lasts about two days. That's gross. That's a terrible, uh, you know, a terrible way to live. So uh, intermittent fasting, I can eat a healthy, big, satisfying meal, and all the things you just described. Cognitive, I used to I'd wake up in the morning if I went to IHOP and slam down, you know, a senior special. I feel like passing out by 11 a.m. Now I don't even touch the food until you know three o'clock in the afternoon, and you know it's just so measurably different and better. So I tell you what, if, if you can get if you can get someone to do it correct or the right way long enough for them to feel the difference, then, then that's the best. And then they know they have the knowledge like, wow, this, this works for me. And, um, <clears throat> but um, the problem is getting people to do it uh, correctly and long enough. Um, but I tell you, um, you know, why would someone actually eat when they're not hungry? Well, a lot of people are doing that and that's what screws everything up. So when you're not hungry, um, why would you eat? Um, cause your body is, um, it's actually eating your fat. And so you have this great thing going and as soon as you eat, you mess it up. And now the body has to 
go through all these hormonal changes. I mean, it's just not a normal thing to eat when you're not hungry. And that's really, we eat 24 seven. I mean, I, Steve, have you ever eaten when you're not hungry? Oh, my life. <laughs> and then guess what? You're going to, you're, it's going to stimulate hunger about an hour and a half away. Yeah, well, it does. And I just want to let the audience know, too, I am not the stereotypical picture of discipline at all. And f so the fact that I can stick with intermittent fasting means that it is really giving me a return on my investment. I'm not hungry. Once you get over it, I don't think about food. And at three o'clock, I'm not ravenous. I just think, well, that's my routine. And I start and I enjoy the heck out of it. I can have a delicious, healthy meal and then go back. Sometimes in the evening, I got to kind of, you know, stick with some soda water and push back the urge just because I'm bored. But what a marvelous change in my whole life. I'm down, you know, 45 pounds from my Twinkie days. And, uh, and I just absolutely love it. So thank you, Dr. Berg, from all of the staff that work with you for the great difference you've made in our lives. So that's terrific. Doc, why don't we move on to the next question? All right. So um, honey, is low on the glycemic index. And is it okay uh, for a ketogenic diet? All right, That'd be yes or no. Okay, dig into that one. Let's see, I've never heard of this. Hope you have. Cassandra from Facebook. I have high ferritin levels. Uh, I don't eat a lot of meat, but I was consuming a lot of pistachios, almonds, almond milk, almond flora products, etc. Is there a connection? Ferritin? Well, uh, ferritin, it's iron, right? So um, I think that there's a lot of people that have too much iron. And this iron over overload messes with your liver. It creates insulin resistance. It creates even diabetes. So um, um, there's very simple um, charts you can get on all the foods that are high in iron, all the ones that are low in iron, and if you make that dietary shift, uh, you'll start feeling better. Um, but I will say that um, you, if you give blood, you'll feel really good. I mean, anytime you feel better when you give blood, suspect you might be overloaded with iron. And then you might have to, instead of red meat, things like that, you should switch the diet to other things that are lower in iron. And there's charts on that. So um, I'm not sure if those nuts are high in that high in iron. I, I don't think they are. But... Um, that's what I would I would do. Well, that's terrific. And here's another one, uh, Julie from YouTube. And I have a little anecdote here. Uh, she wants to know how you can get enough veggies if you only eat once or twice a day. And I've witnessed Dr. Berg fill this sort of salad bowl full of greens and then with a complete disregard to etiquette, just shovels down massive amounts of it. It's just unbelievable. So you are truly stick to what you recommend for people. But, Doc, is that hard to do? How do you do that? When you have salads, okay, um, seven, at least seven cups, okay, it's not that hard. It's, it's, we're just talking like this little handful, right? And then you just, you can chop it up with a salad cutter and it makes it even smaller. But when we're talking about other vegetables like the broccoli, the kale, Brussels sprouts, you're not going to do seven to 10 cups, okay? You're going to do like maybe four to five cups. And, and you, if you're doing one meal a day, that requirement even goes down even further. So you probably don't even need seven cups, probably five would be fine. But if you, the, the reason for this is if you um, don't mind that dog barking in the background, but we're handling that right now. Um, but here's the thing, um, what, why, why do I say that much? Well, if you calculate it and reverse engineer like potassium requirement and magnesium, where are you gonna get that? You should. For the fun of it, sit down and start looking at what you eat and then look at the nutrients in that food and you're like, you're going to end up short. Um, so that's that's why I recommend the salad to get the those two minerals. Now, the other point I want to bring up is when you do a search on these vegetables um, and you get values online, my question is, who calculated those values in the first place? And where do those come from? It's probably a completely outdated uh, evaluation years ago. And unfortunately, um, it's very expensive to test the nutrients in the food. However, I'm involved in a project that I'm going to share with everyone real soon um, on the ability to test your vegetables with a, with a light scanner, which is really awesome. 
awesome technology. Could you imagine going to the grocery store and scanning your vegetables and it tells you if things are nutrient dense or not? Well, guess what? They're finding even some of these organic vegetables are, are just very, very low on the scale. And you could probably know that by tasting them. They're just like empty. Uh, so this is a very interesting subject that um, I'm doing my own research and involved in some research. And I'm um, like, because the, the goal is just to find healthy food. Where do you find it? Where do you find nutrient dense foods? Um, it's a problem. So stay tuned for a lot more information on that. All right. Sounds great. Well, the audience appears to have been watching your videos because the question was true, false. Honey is low in a glycemic index and is okay for a ketogenic diet. And 98% of these rascals said, no, it isn't. 2% hang on to yes. Who's right? The majority is right because the, um, the honey, you know, I, I still get this question like, well, honey is okay, right? I'm like, no, no, it's not. It does have a certain percentage of it fructose and fructose on the glycemic index is 19. So that's low. So the more fructose something would have, the lower it brings that thing down. Like agave nectar is really high in fructose. So it's like low. But here's the problem. Even though um, it's low, your liver is forced to deal with the fructose. Glucose is dealt with all the cells. So it's still a big, big problem because it's going to overload your liver with too much of that type of sugar, which then is going to give you insulin resistance and a fatty liver. So honey is not good on a ketogenic plan. I'm sorry. Shucks. Okay, this is a fair question. Teresa from Facebook, how long should we be fasting before we see a loss of weight? <clears throat> well, you should notice, once you start, you should notice uh, uh, weight loss within the first day. I mean, um, if you're just starting, we know you're retaining at least 11 pounds of fluid, an average person. So that's going to be dumped as soon as you start fasting. You're going to dump all this water. But when we start getting in the fat burning, that might take um, a bit more time. So that's why I don't like to focus on it because I'd rather tell you not to focus on the weight loss and focus on other things. And that way um, you'll stick with it longer because sometimes it takes a healthy body to burn fat. What happens in the beginning part is your body's starting to repair proteins, so you're going to get muscle improvement, water weight loss. But the best indicator, hands down, from anything to know that you're doing better and it's working is that your appetite goes away. That tells me that your body's finally burning your fat, and yes, you may or may not lose weight initially. Eventually you will, but that appetite is the key. Wonderful. Well, I certainly do, as I know you do, admire and appreciate all the stuff women go through to bear our beautiful children. And I haven't heard this question. Asthma from YouTube. Can you please make a video about pelvic girdle pain during and after pregnancy? I still have intense hip and pelvic pain eight months after delivery. It's very hard to walk. Help. I could imagine it's very, very uncomfortable. You just had something that uh, completely stretched out your pelvis to the extreme. Um, there's a lot of things that can be done to help, help that. I think vitamin D, because think about going through pregnancy, you, you really deplete your vitamin D levels. So beefing up your, your vitamin D levels will help inflammation. Um, stinging nettle root is another one. And if you can go to a good chiropractor that can adjust your pelvis, that will greatly help as well, because I used to do that in practice all the, all the time. And it's, a very beneficial thing. Not to mention all sorts of stretches that you can do um, for um, your legs, your hamstrings, your quadricep, and some of the pelvic muscles um, can greatly help. Wonderful. Okay, Doc, how about another question? Here you go. All right. So apple. this is a true or false. Apple cider vinegar is, um, let's see, is good for colon inflammation says is better but um i, I think that says let's yeah, say actually that. doc it says bad for colon inflammation oh okay apple cider vinegar true or false apple cider vinegar is bad for colon inflammation is that true or false and climb on it audience let's see uh this is an oft asked <laughs> question runa from facebook i have no gal excuse me gallbladder can i do keto 
you need to do gallbladder. I mean, I'm sorry, you need to do keto because that uh, without a gallbladder, um, now um, you are going to be deficient in bile. And so what we do is we want more absorption of the fat-soluble vitamins, which you're going to have a hard time with. Well, guess what? Um, keto corrects insulin resistance, and insulin resistance is the thing that's blocking the absorption of nutrients. This is why when people have their gallbladders removed especially and they eat, they don't really feel satisfied. They might feel full after they eat, but they don't feel satisfied because they're not extracting the fat soluble uh, nutrients that they need. Um, so the gallbladder being a storage facility for um, bile is not there. So now we just have a trickling effect from the liver to the small intestine in, in, in a very dilute uh, amount. It's not concentrated anymore. So, What's going to happen is that you're going to be um, deficient in bile, and you may start noticing symptoms uh, like seeing in the dark at night, vitamin E deficiency, vitamin K2, vitamin D deficiency. So the what you should do is do keto with, um, I would recommend, a gallbladder formula. Um, and you take that after the meal. And that way you you can still do keto, fine, and be able to supply what's been missing um, because you don't have a gallbladder. Interesting. You know, uh, we watch the co the uh, questions just cruise by uh, rapidly on uh, YouTube in this case. And so many people ask, you know, is uh, keto okay for this or keto okay for that? Uh, Doc, I think we lost your, your feed. Just a moment, audience. We'll be right back. Memento. Hey, Doc, you got me? Yeah, I got you. Can you hear me? Sure can, loud and clear. All right, where were we? You were just asking me something, and I somehow froze, I think. Did you popped off the screen. Let's see. Um, well, we've got an answer to our question. Why don't we go to that? So that was quiz number three, which asked, true, false, is uh, apple cider vinegar bad for colon inflammation? And the audience response, 75% say that it's false. 25% say it's true. It's no good for your colon. You know, apple cider vinegar, and I will release a video on this apparently, and I'm talking about diluted, not the straight concentration. If you dilute a tablespoon in some water and drink that, it's actually very, very, very beneficial to your colon, especially if you have leaky gut, especially if you have inflammation in the colon because um, – Guess what apple cider vinegar or acetic acid really is? It's a small chain fatty acid that's used by the colon cells to get energy. And when they don't have energy, they start generating inflammation, which is fascinating. So um, if you have IBS, colitis, diverticulitis, don't forget about adding some of this apple cider vinegar as a really unique. Um, extra benefit that you may have not because most people think about upside of vinegar helping uh, blood sugars and weight loss but it has some other great benefits which i will be sharing in a video coming up next week wonderful well, I, I just remember where i was at so again the question stream by us on youtube and facebook but in youtube particularly people are asking is keto okay for this is keto okay for that and doc one time you really helped me instead of focusing on keto the alternative is is three cups of sugar a day better for whatever ails you? And that was such a simple way for me to do it. In other words, knocking out stuff that's not natural and it's, you know, and you're dumping in tons of it with sodas, et cetera, can't be the remedy. So just by default, that question answers itself, I think. Eating healthy versus chugging sugar, uh, I don't think you have to be, you know, a medical genius to figure out that that's not working for us. 
But if you actually do a search on um, um, this topic, you're going to find certain so-called experts that will say, no, it's okay to have sugar. So you, you're always going to have someone in the group that's going to uh, recommend um, sugar. And uh, so, you know, I know this is shocking for people to believe, but there are things online um, that are not true. And um, just because it's online doesn't make it true. Okay. Yeah, that's shocking. Okay, coffee lover from YouTube. Is cold pressed sesame oil okay on keto? Oh, yeah, that's really good. There's a lot of benefits. Sesame oil um, is good for your blood. It's good for the immune system. There's a lot of, a lot of cool benefits. That's cool. Melody from Facebook. A lot of sweeteners out there. Is Pentos kombucha sweetener okay on keto? Um, kombucha. Are you talking about a sweetener? Um, pentos kombucha. I, I don't really, I haven't evaluated that, so I don't know. Okay. Probably tastes good. She wouldn't be asking about it. Let's see. Lynn from YouTube. I like iced coffee better than hot coffee. Me too. Will adding coconut or almond milk with no sugar interfere with my ketosis? I also like adding MCT oil. No. No, because it's a fat. Remember, I talked about that. But here, here's the thing. If you're trying to lose weight and you have too much of that, it may slow you down because your body's going to start using those as ketones and not your own stored body fat. All right, that's terrific. And, uh, you know, we just leave people rotting in the green room, and I feel guilty about it, but we don't want to expend them all at the last second. So next up from Sonoma County, uh, is Rachel, uh, and she has a question for you, doctor. Remember to unmute Rachel. Welcome to the Dr. Berg Show. Hi, good morning, Dr. Berg. Good morning. Um, my question is, so I've been doing the healthy keto intermittent fasting, realized I do feel better when I eat less or, you know, infrequently. So I started doing OMAD. Um, my question, so my plate comes full with, I have all the conditions of metabolic syndrome, I have post-COVID long haulers, and now to add to that fun, I'm now in menopause. So got a lot going on. Um, my question is with OMAD, like what's the best time to eat? Um, what exactly to eat? How much? I mean, kind of like what we're talking about today. How do you, I want to eat to fuel my body to help um, correct what's going on with me. I feel there's solutions to all that's going on with me, and food is really where it's at yeah good question take advantage of um sleeping so you sleep all night so you're fasting all night and that gives you this uh, this momentum to go right in so then in the morning don't you're, you're probably not going to be hungry so you go as long as you can and so that's why i think it's best to eat towards the uh, later part of the day or um maybe even after three or four o'clock and then you can have your first meal. And um, as far as calories go, it, it's if those are nutrient dense calories, you'll need less food. So you want to go by um, what what satisfies you without feeling completely and utterly too stuffed, right? But you want to have a really complete, good nutrient dense meal, which I think you're doing um, right now. But you have these post COVID or long hauler symptoms. Um, I'm going to be releasing a video on that. There's two things after you get this, you know, you do the fasting, which is going to be very, very essential, but also there's this thing called stress, which you see COVID can very easily lower your T cells and allow for other viruses that are latent mm -hmm. to be reactivated. So it might not even be, um, a, a COVID directly, it could be like some of these other things get stirred up and that's creating the fatigue or residual symptom. In which case, if there is still a lot of ongoing stress that you have, you have to identify that because, um, and deal with it because it's like that's such the, it's, it's the key trigger that will keep you from really kind of bouncing back. But if you can do that and you still have these symptoms, then a really good remedy would be sweet um, wormwood. That has like the most potent effect on these latent viruses that will help um, clean up some of the residual 
uh, effect from COVID and from some of these other viruses like Epstein-Barr virus and herpes and all these other things that a lot of people have that have it's gone dur- dormant and it's being reactivated for mm-hmm. some reason. So that would just be something that could actually pull you out of this thing um, once any potential stress that you're sitting on is like removed. Okay. And then with that, so when we do the one meal then, cause yes, I do, I eat in the evening done by seven. Um, so then are there anything like you had said, fat and fiber are best for fasting over carbs and a lot of protein. So um, can you give some examples of if you were eating a meal that, was high in fat, healthy fats and fiber. What, like, what would that look like to you? Okay. Are you talking about like an additional meal? No, I'm talking about if I'm doing one meal a day. Oh, I got it. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So you would have a a big, big bowl of arugula or um, some other vegetables or some salad uh, um, with your olive oil fat, Mm -hmm. right? Put an Mm -hmm. avocado on there. Maybe you have a handful of pecans and then you have a really high quality protein, whether it's salmon, seafood, shellfish, um, grass-fed beef. You know, grass-fed um, beef has massive amount of additional nutrients that corn-fed beef does not have. I mean, it's significant if you could get a good one. Um, so, and then, and then you have the quality of grass-fed. If you get it at the farmer's market versus something that's, you know, at the store, it's just always going to be better. So um, that would be an example. So you get the fiber from the vegetables, and then you have the other fat sources too. So, so you're not doing a lean piece of protein. You're not doing a chicken breast without the skin, for example. That would be um, not the ideal. Maybe you're doing sardines. You know, maybe you're doing tuna with uh, mayonnaise that you made from olive oil, something like that. Um, those are just ideas. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Thanks for your help. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Great. Thanks so much, Rachel, for hanging in there and waiting for us. We've got uh, Tracy coming up in a little bit, but we're going to let her hang in there for a little longer. And just as I indicated that we have a lot of people saying, why can't I eat a pound of sugar a day and be healthy? There's also a great many people that are just so grateful uh, for what you're doing. Lubna from Facebook, Dr. Berg, I cannot thank you enough. I was yo-yo dieting, but started following your videos and have lost 45 pounds. I'm just five pounds away from my ideal Wait, uh, so this is not all conjecture. There's a ton of people that report in that this works because it does. So thank you, Lubna, for that. And let's see, let's hit you with another question. I don't think we've done this. Doc, there you go. Okay, so true or false, uh, coffee can benefit someone with a fatty liver. Okay, audience, what say you? Get on that. Let's see, and let's go back to YouTube. Kimberly, should I break my prolonged fast because of an emergency dental extraction? I'm now in hour 112 and doing healthy keto. Will fasting accelerate my mouth healing process or, or otherwise, I guess? Hey, if you, if you could fast before, during, and after, something like that, it's going to help you greatly. It's going to help you greatly because even when you do a surgery, they always, uh, they'll tell you to fast, right? They try to fast, which is great. Okay, good. Well, if you're already adapted and you're fasting, then you're going to roll right into it. But if you're not uh, fasting and you, and then you fast and you haven't adapted, boy, you're going to be starving when you wake up out of the surgery, uh, which is kind of just messes everything up. So let's say you're going to get a surgery in two weeks. Um, Well, start doing intermittent fasting, (laughs) get your body to adapt to it. then. Just fast before, go through like a day, go through the surgery and try to fast longer. You're going to recover faster, much faster. When you go through surgery, you get um, a a spike in cortisol, massive spike in cortisol. You get a dump of potassium. You can end up with a potassium deficiency. So um, it's a a trauma. It's definitely a trauma. And so um, I've been through several surgeries and... um, it definitely takes some recovering. So uh, the more you fast, the better, the faster you heal. Good luck with that. Okay, Noosh Re from YouTube. How can I reverse a fatty liver? I am obese. How much weight should I try to lose in a month? Well, I just did a video on the top foods that you can eat to um, get clean or strip fat off your liver. 
But if you do just straight keto and intermittent fasting correctly, you can expect to lose 50% of your fat within two weeks off of your liver. Um, that's huge. So you want to stop the carbs, the alcohol, uh, the fructose, all this stuff. And um, stay tuned for the video because I go through that in depth. But um, a good indication of the fatty liver is just to look down at your shoes and see if you see your belly. If you, can, if you can't see your shoes, then chances are you have a fatty liver because the belly is an indication that um, you have a fatty liver. All right. Well, good luck with that. A lot of people with that condition. And uh, quiz question number four was a true false, and it asked, uh, true false, coffee can be beneficial for what we just talked about, a fatty liver. And 80% of the respondents say coffee can help a fatty liver. 20% say no way. Yeah, it can. It's, uh, if you don't overdo it, if you have a, just a cup, it can help. There's certain uh, plant-based chemicals that reduce uh, lipids in the fat. So this is why a lot of uh, the keto community drink coffee. I, no, that's not why, but I do notice that uh, like one of my last summit, everyone is lined up to get coffee. So uh, yeah, it's definitely um, keto friendly as long as you don't add those creamers and the sugar. All right, well, that makes uh, perfect sense. Let's launch out our final question for today. I'm talking about the like the artificial creamer creamers type things, but you can put a little cream in, in your coffee, not a problem. Very good. Okay, final question. All right, so um, post-exertional fatigue um, could be a symptom of what? Okay, folks, that was... So, so let's say, for example, you start to um, exercise, right? Or start to do something, exert yourself, and you're just like, oh my gosh, I'm just... So don't have any energy. What's going on? You know, what, what is that a symptom of? Okay, very good. Let's see. Why don't we uh, wrap, well, not wrap things up, but wrap up the people in a green room with the uh, uh, lovely Tracy who come from California and is now in uh, lovely and fun Austin, Texas. Uh, Tracy, you're on with Dr. Burke. Hi. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving hope. Uh, over here. Um, my question, you kind of already answered. Um, I, the, um, I use basically all of your products, loving them, and I appreciate them. Um, and I'm taking, I'm doing the fasting about four to six hour eating window for about three months now. And um, it's Overall, it's making me feel a lot better, but I think there's some sort of, from hearing what you said in the last question, uh, answering the last question, that there's probably some sort of hidden thing because there's other new things coming out now. Like I wake up in the morning with stiff and crampy calves and I have the neck pain, which I never have any back pain. That wasn't my problem. And now I'm having these weird things. So I'm wondering, is there something that, Maybe I'm doing wrong. You don't know my life, though, but <laughs> maybe I'm doing wrong. Or is there something that I'm missing um, that triggers from some of the stuff I've said? Um, that's my question. So so um, if we just take one thing, I think you said stiffness on the right side. Is that what you said? Well, yeah, and I've watched those videos. That you said is gallbladder or liver. Yeah, and that's real easy to experience on the keto because we tend to – overload a little bit too much on the extra extra fats and MCT oil. I don't know what you're eating, but like if you had a keto bomb with a coconut, that would definitely like, whoa, that kind of stirred up something underneath my red rib cage. It refers to the right side. Um, especially right here, I would look at gallbladder. And, um, and then just, uh, um, you know, beef up some more salads with maybe just a little bit less extra fat. I don't know if that's the situation or not. No, I, I only eat salads and um, really great meat. That okay, we good. Farm. So I don't, yeah, so maybe it's in, something's not, it's not taking too many products too, right? I mean, can we overload on too many? Does that cause any kind of, it, I mean, I, I can't imagine because the stuff that I have is does not have anything that could do that. Um, yeah. But 
Is there any other symptoms other than the right side stiff that you have? It's the calves that cramp in the morning, and then once I start walking around, it stops. I'm still bloated all the time. It's small, but it's I know that's not my regular body. Um, dehydrated, I'm. That's been an. That's been a long term thing where I feel dehydrated, although I'm drinking nonstop with minerals. Okay, um, how much sea salt do you have in your diet? And I take sea salt. Oh, you with, do. Okay. Yeah. Um, I should tell. I have. I have H. pylori. That's what has been an ongoing thing. Uh, so I don't know if those things. So is it a normal thing for you to have to go through this period? And I have to be on keto long. I mean, obviously for my life. But so you just gave me a really good clue because. Um, most people have this H. pylori as a normal thing in their gut, but it becomes a problem once the pH in your stomach becomes uh, weakened or um, less acid. So I would go in the direction of more um, to acidify the stomach by um, probably betaine hydrochloride is going to be probably the most important thing, but you need quite a bit of that. Sometimes you might need even six right before a meal. Um, and, and what that will do, guess what that does? It increases the absorption of the minerals because if the pH isn't right, you're not going to absorb those minerals, thus getting the cramped legs. Okay. Uh, also, that acid is necessary to activate the release of bile to help the digestion of fats so you're not bloated. Yeah. Um, so that's you just gave me that probably the, the missing link with that. So Great. Um, yeah, that would be helpful. And then the other thing that you you really want to keep experimenting until this these cramps in your legs go away or your feet, like you may need to add some additional calcium right before bed. You might just need that because most of my products, they don't I don't have a lot of calcium in them. And so that could be one thing that's missing, possibly. Okay, great. And then oh, that's so helpful. Um, and then one little little this really is a little question. The, the moles, the videos for getting rid of moles, the garlic and the iodine, is there a trick so that you don't get the skin around it? Any little secret trick? Because it seems to be um, taking away skin around it. You're talking about the iodine drops? Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, there's a, this remedy that, I have, that I'm going to talk about in this video. Okay. Um, because we're dealing with, sometimes we're dealing with papillomavirus. Um, wormwood extract is a good one for that. Um, that's a good remedy um, just for viruses in general. Um, but um, with, with putting this solution, you might want to just put just the tiniest a bit right on that mole or that uh, skin tag and yeah. then try to put a Band-Aid over it so it doesn't spread. Um, and if it is related to a virus, it should just shrink and go away. <laughs> um, you can also uh, do a similar thing. I've, I've heard people use a little bit of garlic clove on that point too and put a Band-Aid over it. That seems to work too, and that might be another solution as well because of the Allison effect on these. They kind of just shrink tumors, and that's what it is. And a birthmark is the same thing as a mole or a, right? Birthmarks? Yeah, but I don't think those are going to go away. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, it's mainly for skin tags. Um, Got it. Oh, I'm so glad to clarify that. Thank you. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> okay. That's great. Well, Tracy, yeah. listen, enjoy your new home in Austin, and thanks everybody in the that joined us on video. And remember, uh, you can go to drberg.com to get your chance to get on the air uh, and ask these fascinating questions. And uh, in terms of products, uh, Dr. Berg, you want to share with people how people outside of the United States have a better abil ability to get these things affordably. We're just constantly working on ways to get uh, the price down with shipping. So if you're out of this country, there should be a link down below. You can ask access that and uh, hopefully avoid the shipping costs that is a killer. But I recently found a new company uh, that lowers the shipping. So that I'm excited about that. Even the, in the U.S., it's a lot less expensive shipping now. So that is exciting. Indeed. Okay, final question uh, asked uh, 
post-exertion fatigue could be a symptom of what? And 55% of the um, respondents say electrolytes, 15% say low salt levels, 10% say low magnesium, 10% say low potassium, and 10% say high sugar levels. Okay, so the, I think there's three three main <clears throat> things with that. Number one is um, low sodium. That will make your muscles weak, especially if you attempt to exercise. Um, potassium is number two. And number three is viruses. Um, if you had mono or herpes, which by the way, 90% of the population has a virus in their body and it gets reactivated when you're stressed. And that can show up classically as a, wow, I just start to exercise and I just, I just don't have that my body's not helping me. I have to drag my body to do a workout. So it's just, a, it's one of those things that it's very um, common and people don't realize it. They keep pushing themselves. They don't know that that's behind it. And to resolve that, I, I, you'll have to watch my video. Um, but there's um, that wormwood is a really good remedy in addition to um, doing whatever you can to address your stress. Uh, that's like, um, and if that's not addressed, it's really hard for these remedies to work. So if you're, um, trying to solve a certain problem and both you're not doing keto and you're stressed out, it doesn't really matter. The remedies just don't seem to impinge. Um, very important point because people always want a remedy. How do I fix this with a remedy? Well, let's first make sure that your basic eating is in make sure your stress isn't too high and then watch it work. It's going to work a lot better. Well, that's terrific. Okay, Facebook, as we get close to the end, when are you going to, and this is maybe for Karen, when are you going to publish a book of your favorite keto recipes, or have you already done it? Uh, we already have, um, wait, do we have that out there? I think we haven't released it yet. So there is one coming out that's, uh, uh, stay tuned. It's, uh, we've been working on that. It's a really cool one. It's and then and also we have all the things that people want, like they want to know the calories of this and that. That's all going to be in there. So um, I'll have to find out when that's going to be released. So stay tuned. Right, that's interesting. I've had the honor with some other um, employees there of Dr. Berg to eat at their home. And what Karen and I guess Dr. Berg picks is, and I'm telling you, there is no suffering at a keto meal at the Berg's. <laughs> I mean, it's just delicious. You think you're cheating. Uh, but you ain't. So anyway, thanks for that. So I'm sure if there's a forthcoming book, you all will be absolutely uh, delighted. Uh, Doc, let's see. We've got a couple minutes left. Uh, why don't I uh, see if I got one more question? We've done so well with social media this time. Uh, look at this. Just Why don't we wrap up with this? Another thank you. Kimberly from Facebook, thank you so much for all of the knowledge you share with everyone. It helps us in our daily lives overcoming these stresses, on our bodies, and we're so very grateful. I think that's a great way to wrap, Doc. And uh, I don't know if you have any other words. Hey, I appreciate that very much. Uh, um, spending s some good amount of research, I found a new uh, research tool. It's called Elicit. It's called Elicit.org, and it's amazing because it evaluates two hundred million papers. <laughs> And so when you go there, you can just type anything and you get all this great data. And so now it's going to speed things up for me to um, kind of validate some of the stuff I'm talking about. So um, stay tuned for some really interesting videos on um, various topics that you're going to find interesting. I appreciate all of your attention and your wonderful comments. Uh, we will see you next week, same time, same place.